Okay. Um, right. This is Robert Worden here <coughs> talking about fire mappings and transforms. And there are three objectives on this WebEx. Firstly, is to discuss the challenge of building fire interfaces in healthcare applications and, and how important that is and some of the difficulties of it. Secondly, to learn about a particular approach to doing that, and that is the fire mapping language, which has been developed as part of Fire SCU3, and to show you some examples of using that to build fire interfaces. And thirdly, to describe some tools which are becoming available from Code for Health for working with fire mapping language and for developing fire transforms. So, uh, the issue with fire as an intermediate language between different applications, and, and that is really FHIR's main purpose as a transfer language for healthcare information. <clears throat> in order to use it in that way, you need to work with existing legacy applications, and those applications need to interface to FHIR. So whenever you're working with FHIR, you have to build some transforms from your existing applications or your existing integration engine or whatever it may be, to fire and, and from fire in both directions. So if you have a, a healthcare application with a database, you've got to build a transform there. <coughs> if you're if already working with HL7 standards, such as CDA or HL7 version two, <coughs> you have to build transforms between them and fire. If you're working with the open air standard, you have to build transforms. Or if you're working through an integration engine, Again, you have to build the transforms, but they may be hosted in a different place. They may be hosted on your integration engine rather than on your application itself. And so in order for FHIR to succeed as an intermediary language, people are going to have to build a lot of these transforms to all existing healthcare applications. Now, the problem is that building those transforms is quite a big cost item. Um, you have to understand your legacy, your source data, you have to understand the fire representation of it, and you have to build transform software between the two, possibly to go in both directions, to fire and from fire. And this is quite a big cost item, and it is holding interoperability back. In fact, building transforms has always been the big cost item in interoperability, and fire reduces that cost, but certainly doesn't eliminate it. And so that cost is holding interoperability work back. And I think specifically, it's probably holding the work of interopen back in that members are finding the cost of building fire interfaces quite prohibitive to all their applications. What this talk is about is improved ways and more cost effective ways of building those fire transforms. And there are really two ingredients I want to talk about here. One is the fire mapping language, which is a language deliberately intended at building fire transforms developed by Graham Greve as part of the fire STU3 standard. And secondly, a tool you can use that with that uh, called transforms by example, uh, TBE for short. So those are the two main things I'm going to be talking about in this WebEx, describing how you use fire mapping language and how you use TBE. So the fire mapping language is part of the fire standard SU3, and here is the web page on the fire site describing it. And so it is a declarative language and a quite compact language in which you define mappings between your source and your target. And your source may be something like <coughs> HL7 version two, and your target will be some fire bundle. And once you define these mappings, uh, the mapping engine, which is supplied as part of the fire reference implementation, can do the transforms for you. There is a mapping engine that does those transforms, and I'll show you it. However, the fire mapping language is at an early stage of adoption, a low stage of maturity, it's actually maturity level two, zero, you can see on this slide. And there is a learning curve for the language that, um, you know, it, it's unfamiliar, it's different. You have to learn it before you can start using it at the moment. So those are the inhibitors to using fire mapping language. It is in principle, a faster way of developing transforms, and it's a standard way. It's part of the fire standard, which is a big advantage. But there are these inhibitors that it's a very early stage of adoption. There is a learning curve, and not many people know what it's about. So that's fire mapping language in its current state. <clears throat> transforms by example is a new technique that my company has developed, 
which you can use in conjunction with fire mapping language. And the idea there is, in order to develop a new transform, you don't need to write Java code or C sharp code or whatever, and you don't need to learn a new mapping language like fire mapping language. All you do to create a new transform is to create test cases, which are examples of the source and the target that you intend the transform to create from that source. So you can typically get the examples of the source quite easily out of your existing applications. They may be version H07 version 2, or it may be open air, or it may be a relational database. You can get the source examples quite simply. What you need to do to develop a transform is to provide the target example, which is what your transform has to create out of that source. And both the source and the target must conform to the required data structures, and they must illustrate what your transform has to do. And there are various complications there, but basically, if you provide test cases which illustrate the source and the target, then the tools will do the rest. They will actually generate the transform for you, and they will provide you with the transform in several different forms, including in fire mapping language. So this is a way of not writing fire mapping language, but generating it from your examples. And an alternative form is you can have the transforms in Java. So this way of developing transforms can be a really big cost saver. And I'll illustrate that on the next slide. Uh, this slide shows the normal V life cycle for developing a p any piece of software, including transform software. You start by analyzing your requirements. At some stage, maybe not very early on, but you have to prepare test cases to test that the transform you're developing does the job you want it to do. Then you design the transform, you code it in whatever language you like, and you or you write mappings, say in fire mapping language, then you do some unit tests, then you test the whole transform, and finally you deploy it. So the full set of boxes is the full V life cycle for developing a transform, and it's what most people do. Most people develop transforms in code. With the TBE, transform by example, only the solid boxes are the things you have to do. You understand your requirements and you prepare very good test cases. From then on, the tools do the rest for you. They generate the transform in fire mapping language, say, or in Java. They run it automatically on your test cases and they summarize the results and then you <coughs> What you have to do is to iteratively refine that transform by improving your examples, and then you can deploy it. So this can be a big effort saver in developing transforms. And that I'm going to demonstrate to you next, show how this works. The demonstration case is a transform between open air and open air composition for an allergy intolerance and a fire bundle, which is a bundle containing the allergy intolerance resource. There are other demonstration projects which will be available, and, and you can get them by contacting me, but this is the one I'm going to concentrate on first. And to do that, I stop the presentation and go into the tools which do the transform. So I end the show for the moment, and I put up the tools which do transforms by example, and this is an Eclipse-based tool set. And the first thing, I, and what you do is you prepare the target and source examples, and then you prepare a little file which tells the tools all the inputs they need and all the outputs you want to produce from it. And you tell the tools to go away and generate the transform. So what I will do first is to show you this little input file, this gen file, which defines the inputs and the outputs. And the best way to see it is as a CSV file in Excel, which separates the columns very clearly. So if I show you that gen file, it's here. And you can see it's only got about six or seven columns. The first row, rows, sorry, uh, the first row defines the structure of your source and your target. In this case, the source structure is an open air composition. And they are defined by what's called an operational template file, an opt file, which says this is an open air composition. It obeys the composition schema, but also it uses certain archetypes and templates. And the archetypes and templates that it uses which in this case are specialized to allergies and adverse reactions, are defined in this opt file. And that's the kind of thing you can download and, and, and you have if you're, built, if you're working in open air. The target is a fire bundle. And I've got a little file called a prof file here, which 
simply defines the resources that are in that bundle. And they can be either core fire resources, part of the core fire standard, or they can be profiled <coughs> resources with slicing and extensions and so on and so forth. And you would typically here be using the UK Care Connect profiles to define your bundle. So that's the first row of this file. First row, first input this method requires is definitions of the structures of source and target. Next, it requires some examples. In this case, we've only got one example pair. And that the example pair consists of an open air composition in that XML file. And that was simply downloaded from a Mirand open air repository. As I say, you normally get your source example from an existing application. And what I had to create by hand was the target example, which was the fire bundle, which the transform is intended to produce. And so those are the two inputs required for the process, for the generation process. The remaining rows de defines the outputs I want from it. Uh, I'll briefly summarize these the results file. Uh, the generation process and the testing process produces a detailed trace or log of all it's doing. And you look at that trace in order to find where your transform is not yet doing what you want it to do and how you need to improve your examples. So you save that detailed trace in a CSV file. Round trip refers to the fact that the transforms you produce this way can work in both directions. And you can do a round trip test going from open air to fire and back again to open air or starting at fire, going to open air and back again and examine the results of that test as well. Auto test means that when you generate any transform, automatically the tools will test it against your source examples and will summarize the results for you, and we'll see that. Fire mapping says you want this in transform in a fire mapping language, and so it's going to produce that file there. And Java says you also want the transform in Java form, and that's Java that works on top of the happy Java reference implementation. And so it, that's where the Java class is going to be. So that is the inputs and outputs of the transform generation process. And first, before I actually do the generation process, I will show you what the source and target example pair looks like. Here is the source XML coming up in the center of the screen. And this is an open air archetype. And there's all sorts of guff at the front. But when you get down to the meat of it, the content, um, somewhere down here, you find that it's an allergy to flour is flour, and the reaction of the allergy, which is somewhat lower down here, is sneezing. So this is an allergy person who's allergic to flour and sneezes when he's exposed to it. And the person's name somewhere up here is Alan Watts. And the clinician who uh, recorded this is Tony Shannon. So that's the sort of information that's in the open air composition. The target, which the transform is supposed to produce from that, is a fire bundle shown here, which contains the same information, basically. So it's a fire bundle. It has an entry. That entry is a resource. It's an allergy intolerance resource. It first it has a reference to the patient, who's called Alan Watts. And then it has a reaction part, which says uh, the substance which causes the reaction is flour here. And that's in the SNOMED code. And the reaction is sneezing. So I've constructed that fire example to have the convey the same information as the allergy intolerance uh, composition that, that's my source. Having constructed the source and the target, I now instruct the tools to go and generate the transform. And I do this by right-clicking this gen file here. And I get a menu option, generate transform. And I just do that. Now, on this little machine, it will take a few seconds to do that before it comes up with some results. So there it's thinking. Um, and when it finishes, it's going to show us a summary of all the things it's done and all the problems it's found when it finishes. So we have to wait a few more seconds for that, it seems. Uh, this is a demo problem, waiting in suspense. It is taking a long time. And then when we've got the results, we'll examine the test of the transform and the generated fire mappings and the Java code. So that's looking ahead a bit to when this thing finally finishes. Here we are. It's finished. So in this inference window at the bottom, it produces a log of everything it's done, everything it's found. And the first thing it produces is some structure warnings where 
the examples you provided didn't conform exactly to the source and target structure. So there were various exercise type attributes missing in the source, and there were various missing source items and so on. If these problems are too serious, it will throw its hand in the air and stop doing it, and it'll tell you what where your examples are wrong, and you can correct them. But given they're not too serious, it goes on and tries to infer some mappings, uh, and that is statements of how the source corresponds to the target. And so the next few rows are what is done inferring mappings. And it produces some warnings where it finds values in the target that it can't derive in any way from the source. And one of the values it's found in the target, for instance, it can't derive from the source in any way, is the URL of the SNOMED code system. It hasn't found that, so it couldn't do that with its mappings. However, it's made a load of mappings, and you can see in this mapping log what is done, and that can be useful information in future if you want to refine the, the mappings. And then, having made the mappings, it does an automatic test. And the automatic test is simply running the transform it's generated on your source examples and test cases and comparing the results automatically with your target example you've provided. And in this case, when it generated, when it did the transform and compared the result with the input example, it found two nodes missing. And they were the, SNOMED, the system nodes, which are actually those SNOMED codes that I showed you before. You can go and verify this by looking yourself at the transform result, and that's in this file here where you said you wanted it to be. And that is a fire bundle, very much like the fire bundle we can put in. But you can see the SNOMED codes are actually missing. The, the, the definition of the SNOMED code system, by the way, rather, is actually missing. Um, and you can look at this. Um, yes, well, OK. Finally, what it did was run the fire mappings it generated. And again, it got more or less the same result, that that system attribute was missing. Um, if we just look briefly at the fire mappings, uh, they're, they're quite complicated. I mean, it's a very concise language. And if you want to learn about the fire mapping language, this is a very good way to do so, to actually generate a transform yourself and look at what the fire mappings are, try and look at how they are doing that transform. But that has created that fire mapping language and has run it again on your source examples to see what differences come out with your target examples. So that's the fire mapping language, which for most people will be something quite new and something they're not familiar with. But this is a very good way to learn about fire mapping language. The Java form of the transform is shown here. And that is a Java class. Uh, and it's actually quite simple to read, because it's a bunch of methods that call each other. And each method has Java doc, which says, where you are in the target structure, here we are at the target structure bundle entry resource reaction. We're in the target, in the reaction, in the fire bundle, and all the pieces of the source that it may need to look at to derive that part of the target. And then this Java code here, if you're familiar with Java and spend a little time, you can quite easily understand what it's doing. So a big benefit of this method is that it doesn't suffer from the inflexibility of a lot of mapping methods, because a lot of people, developers say, well, mapping's all very well, but it can't quite do all I want. I'm going to have to do some special stuff somewhere uh, because of, say, data quality problems in the source. How do mappings let me do that? In this case, you've got some generated Java. You can understand it. If you need to modify that Java to do special things, you can do so with this. If you want to test this Java, uh, you have to compile it before you test it. Uh, and so what I've done here is actually compiled that same piece of Java already. And once I've compiled it, I can run a test on the same test cases as I've done before by, again, right-clicking this gen file. And it gives me an option, run Java transform. And what it says immediately is, hey, you've generated some new Java since you compiled the last lot of Java. Do you want to run the, your old Java? And I say, yes. Oh, gosh. And then it does the transform and does the comparisons again. And again, what's missing is this SNOMED system attribute. Just talk briefly about why that's missing. Uh, that SNOMED system attribute, I'll, I'll go back to it and just show it you on the screen. 
it's here, hcpsnowbed.info.sct slash sct. That is a, a value in the target that it couldn't find anywhere in the source. And so it didn't know what to do. But there will be quite a lot of values in the target that you don't find in the source. And these are fixed values, part of the fire definition, uh, which are fixed for all occurrences. And how these tools recognize fixed values is if the same value occurs more than once at the same place in the target, um, then it recognizes it as a fixed value. And why were, and, but this SNOMED value is only, as we have provided only one example, it only had one example of, of this and one example of that. And so it, it couldn't deduce the fact that it's a fixed value. And I can cure that simply by providing the same example twice. And then it says, ah, this thing's occurring twice in the same place, so it's a fixed value. Um, so I guess that concludes the demonstration. Uh, what I could briefly do uh, before I finish is show you the round trip test. And for that, I have a thing called a data sources file. And I set up some data sources, which you will see in this bottom window here. Uh, <clears throat> the example that these two data sources are called A and B. And A is the open air example I gave it. And B is the fire example I gave it. And so what the round trip test is going to do is to do all the transforms and round trips that it can do between the source and the target. And it's going to summarize the results for me. So I do this round trip test by selecting this menu option, translation test. And again, this system's going to think for quite a while before it has done all the transforms <coughs> and summarized the results for me. And here it is in thinking time. Um, but basically, when I get results, they're going to be things like A, B, which summarizes it's done the translation from open air to fire, or B, A says it's done the translation from fire to open air, or A, B, A says it's done the translation from open air to fire and back again to A. And so that's what these rows mean in the translation summary view. It's done all these transforms and round trips, and it's summarized the results. And the important column is this one here, the percent column. And so A, B says, I did the translation from A, which is open air, to B, which is fire. There were 28 items of information in the source, and 100% of those got through to the target. And similarly, A, B, A says, I went from open air to fire and back to open air again, and 100% of the information items got through. When I did the round trip starting from fire, I only got 93%, and that's quite an interesting result, and you can examine that by looking in this issues windows and see why that came out. But you can also have a look at all those test results directly. So they're all stored in this file folder here. And if we look, for instance, at aba.xml, that is the result of going from open air to fire and back again. And you can check yourself that that hasn't lost information. So that is a quick summary of the transform by example method. Just to recap it, you, well, I'll recap it on the next slide when I go back to the presentation. Right, so um, recapping the TB method from current slide. Summarizing, it is a very quick way of developing transforms because you don't develop software. You have to develop good test cases. And that's, you would have to do anyway. So there are no new skills required. You don't need to understand some new mapping language. You can understand the generated code in Java, providing you read Java. And it's an e if you want to learn fire mapping language and use it because it is more productive, it's an easy way to start learning it. However, you do have the flexibility of the generated code. You can edit it to do the things you want it to do, supposing there are data quality problems in the source that you want to deal with in some special way. And you can use standard Java tools. You can trace it, debug it, and so on and so forth. Uh, what I would say is this is a very test-driven style of development. You create your example pairs, and you find you run a test immediately. It just takes a few seconds, really. And you find the transform doesn't quite do all you want it to do. And so what you do then is you refine your example pair, and you run around the, the iterative cycle again. So it's a very rapid testing cycle, which is a very good way of, of getting high-quality, reliable transforms. You're very soon, uh, you very soon see the limitations of what you've developed. 
The other thing about this method is if you've already been developing transforms in some other approach, for instance, simply by writing code, then you will have test cases of those, uh, of those transforms. You'll have source and target pairs. And you can use those source target pairs to put them as input to the transform by example method. And so you, if you've been doing some other thing, like some other mapping tool or writing transforms in code, you can very easily switch to transform by example without losing your previous investment in the methods you've been using before. So that is um, what TBE is and how it links up with fire mapping language. I'm doing uh, a project for the Fire Foundation um, <clears throat> on enhancing support for fire mapping language, and that includes the work I've shown you here, which is the transform by example, uh, the Eclipse-based mapping tool set that you've seen here, which includes a graphical mapping editor, various other things. Um, I would refer you to a paper which is about to be presented at ITIC 2017 to hear about details of that project. But the important thing, ah, Next slide, I haven't anticipated this, is this gives you different ways to understand mappings and transforms. You can understand fire mapping language, and that's what fire mapping language looks like. I won't go into the details of it. Or you can understand generated Java code, which looks like this. And there's a very close correspondence between these two. So if you want to read the fire mapping language and then hop across to the Java code and see what it does, that's a very easy way of understanding it. Or you can look at these mappings visually in a visual mapping editor, or you can look at them in a spreadsheet. So what this does is it gives you a whole list, gives you four different ways of regarding your transform, basically, four different ways of understanding it, and you can choose whichever way you, you prefer. So the summary message is that this project that's improving and evaluating these tools, what it needs is case studies comparing this method with previous methods. So if you've been developing transforms by some other method and you're prepared to work with us to provide those transforms as examples, we can try and reproduce them in this technology and see what the effort is. What we want to do is to calibrate the effort required for this approach versus the effort required for hand coding or making mappings and so on and so forth. And so uh, this is an appeal really for people who have been doing fire transforms by whatever method. If they want to learn whether this method can improve their productivity and do it better for them, then we'd love to work with them to examine those as case studies and see just what kind of cost savings you can achieve by this method. So if you want to find more about this, it is going up on the Code for Health website and is going to be made available without license fee to NHS organizations and to developers of open source software. But to find out about it immediately, just email me here at this address and uh, I can discuss with you what we can do in terms of a case study.